So while their wives were driving their Rolls Royces around uh, and mixing it up with the Tampa elite, uh, Douglas Cohn and Don Carlson were often, it seemed, busy uh, with their businesses. Um, Mr. Cohn owned a, a giant um, highway construction company, so it took him out away from his family often, uh, particularly on the weekends. He was gone a lot. And um, then Carlson was busy with this kind of a sensitive government job of some sort that took him away from his family uh, for long stints at a time he was gone. These business trips actually masked a shocking secret. Mr. Cohn was Mr. Carlson. And he was raising two affluent families in lavish homes 20 miles apart for more than 30 years. And Jean Ann Cohn had no clue that he was living a double life. Now, this brings up a lot of questions. <laughs> what in the world? Right? And, and, and then how about this? How in the world did he do this? <clears throat> Married for 52 years. No idea that he had an entirely different family. Three kids with his wife and two with the other. But the, the best question is, why? Why would a man fantasize about a life with another woman and then go to such great lengths to actually make it a reality? Why in the world? As shocking as this story is, Jesus teaches us that we all have a propensity towards the double life. We all have a tendency to live lives that are not true and pure, integrated and holistic. And this is what he calls us all to do because this is the good life. And so today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5. Everybody turn there. Matthew 5, um, verses 27 through 30. Always bringing the Bible, okay, to church because that's what we do. We have no authority. I have no authority on my own to say a word to you today that has any power. But today we're going to talk about um, managing our desires. Now, that's kind of a misnomer because uh, in terms of sin, we don't manage sin. You eliminate sin. You don't manage it. And yet we all manage it, don't we? Like, oops, if, I don't, if I'm not found out or if I do this thing, um, if it doesn't mess up too much, I'm going to go there. But we don't manage sin. Now, parents, you know this. Um, I think this is a message for everybody, even our kids. It's a sensitive topic. We're going to talk about that today. You probably got an email. I know you did if you read it uh, that said, hey, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about sex today. We're going to talk about adultery today. And it's the Bible, okay? So it's, it's, it's straight from God's word. We're going to talk about a topic that really is a sensitive topic for us today, okay? So uh, this can get real tender, gang, um, if not heartbreaking for some of us who've walked through the challenge of broken relationship that the Lord has intended for us. And so, again, I'm, I've prayed much that you would receive this well and that the Lord would speak into your own heart, uh, a reminded of his grace and his love for you and, and how much uh, he, he has redeemed all things that he has allowed or that we've made possible, okay? So what he's doing here, we're into the second of um, six antitheses, they're called, where he says, um, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And the one we're going to look at today, he, what he's doing, he's quoting, literally quoting from the Ten Commandments, uh, as he did last week. Uh, you've heard it said, don't murder, but I tell you, even anger and a, and a dehumanizing of another person and insulting of another person is a murder of sorts. Like, I, don't even, I wish you weren't even alive in my life right now, is a form of murder. Today, he's going to do the same. What he's doing is he, he'll quote the, the actual command. Then he'll take us to the deeper original intent of the command, which it's always been. It's not something new. 
is what he's saying. I didn't come to dismantle any of this. I came to fulfill it, meaning in me and in the way that I'm teaching this and in you, this can be fulfilled. You can live this out is what he's saying by the power of the Holy Spirit. So then he flips it, though, even in the end where he says, for instance, don't murder, hey, bring life, right? He'll say, don't steal, be generous to everyone. Today, don't commit adultery. Let truth prevail in every one of your relationships. So don't miss this. This is for all of us here. Young and old, single. We have a lot of single, maybe more single people than married who are here. And this is for all of us, young and old, everybody here. Okay? And this has hit me along the way in this study too, um, is that Jesus, okay, how about this? The one who issued the commands is the one bringing commentary to it. That's kind of cool. Like, I wrote this. Uh, and let me, let me tell you what it means, right? And I, I just think that is amazing. Jesus is bringing exegesis of the scripture. So this is, this is incredible, which is why we sit with him. It's why we're in our dwell reading every day. We're dwelling and abiding in him. Lord, teach me. Keep speaking to me because we now have the Holy Spirit in us. But don't miss this. This is another cool twist in it. Uh, as our um, connect groups are all walking through the Beatitudes starting today, uh, teachers you can, you, can, you can quote your pastor here. Um, all the Beatitudes and all the Sermon on the Mount is autobiographical. Jesus lived this out perfectly. He's the one who is perfect theology embodied. None of us are, though we're striving to live that way. And by his spirit, we can live that way. But it's fascinating what he's doing here. He's showing us that outward compliance to the law Okay, is, is not what he's after. He's after inward transformation, which is why he says, blessed are the pure in heart. It takes a pure heart to have spiritual vision. And so he's showing us this is how you can live this way. This is just so powerful. Uh, Jesus is calling us to understand the depth, okay, of this command and the danger of the human heart. And, and he sh he's going to show us then a drastic call to action, okay? You may have heard this before. Let me read it over you. Um, we won't put it on the screen. I just want you to hear this. Uh, it was uh, originally just heard from Jesus. You have heard it said. You have heard that it was said. You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the members, uh, one of your members, that uh, a part of your body, than that your whole body be thrown to hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than that your whole body be given over or go to hell. Wow. Okay, immediately, again, any passage that talks about sexuality, we all, we all start to blush a little bit. And there's a reason for that. Uh, what I have learned as a pastor through the years, uh, the devastating reality of adultery, you can't imagine. I've sat with, with couples who've walked through this. Um, I've, I've seen in my own experience as a pastor, there, there is no... I don't think a deeper hurt and a deeper pain than to walk through a broken uh, covenant relationship that you've made with one another. I've experienced it, uh, this. It's, it's, it's this. There, there's no shame like sexual shame. And I think all of us have a sense of this personally. So if we all come to this um, and just say, you know, we're all in varying degrees, we're all sexual sinners. And, and we all fall short here. And so we fall upon the grace of God and we need him just to, to restore us. And you'll be reminded today, as we already have been, you have been restored. If you're in Christ, you have been redeemed. You have been restored. But let's dive into this and allow the spirit of God to speak to us, okay? So first of all, the depth of the command. We're gonna talk about the depth of command, then the danger of the human heart and a drastic call, as you've already heard. So first of all, you, you've heard it said, that it, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Now, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this part right here. Why the command? And you say, well, because it's wrong. And most societies would say the same. We've always had a propensity throughout all of history to go after each other. Um, our, our sexual sin can run rampant. And, and, and there's often this depth underneath this command that we often miss. Why the command? 
Remember that the Ten Commandments were given to a certain group of people, and it was a covenant agreement, okay, with a certain group, the ancient Israelites, okay? They were to be a holy people, set apart from all other people. So God says, here are the commands that are going to set you apart. And even marriage itself is a covenant agreement. Now, us modern, you know, sophisticated types in North Dallas, we're like, well, covenant, that's like an old word. That's an archaic word, isn't it? Listen, there's not a better word. There, there, this is in a category all its own. It's not a contract. We've talked about this before. It's a covenant. And it's not 50-50. It's 100%. I'm in. I'm in. We are in this together. But watch this. Jesus is also affirming the legal the legal aspect of marriage. We have people who think, well, you know, I, I can love, we can just love each other, live together, not legally be married. Listen to this. Jesus is affirming the legal commitment in marriage. Loving, okay, covenant agreement before God Almighty and a legal aspect as well. Why is this significant? Because there's going to be days when you don't feel like loving your spouse. But with a legal, legally binding commitment, you are in. You're all in. And I know the world doesn't go this way, but this is what God calls us to be. And I am convinced that the way that we live out our sexuality, the way that we live out our marriages in, in our world today in this cultural moment is a powerful prophetic witness to everybody around us. Because not everyone, think about this, who has heard this kind of teaching I'm offering today? A lot of people in our culture have never heard this before. And, and so this is so important to understand. Not only this, but Jesus is also affirming this, the, this, the spiritual or biblical, traditional, orthodox vision of marriage. And, and what's beautiful about this is, he, and, he, and he affirms this again in Matthew 19, marriage is between one man and one woman for life. And this is beautiful, not the same, but different. There's unity in our diversity, and it's no wonder that we, you know, any couple stays together, right? But this is the beauty of marriage. We come together in our differences, and so what happens is, watch this, sex in marriage becomes a sacrament. It sounds strange. It's a sacred oath, okay? So, Make us all blush a little bit. But every time that there, there's the sexual act in marriage, it's a recommitment to the fact that I am always, how about this, vulnerable, completely honest, just myself, can I say it, naked before you. This is how we live all the time. Totally honest. And if you're not yet married or, or ha maybe you've been married, maybe we maybe we'll never be married. But what happens in any close relationship is that the person becomes a mirror of sorts. And in marriage, you know, this is true where you can't hide anymore. Now, evidently, uh, my guy Cone was hiding out. So it's possible for us to hide, isn't it? But do you see the depth of this command? He's, he's saying this is wrong, and here's the reasons why. Adultery breaks down this sacred covenant that we made with one another, and it reveals the holy heart of God. It's why Paul says in Ephesians 5, and this is the unique thing about Christian marriage, is it's not about the marriage. It's about something else. It's about someone else. He says that, that marriage is like 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 the bride who loves the groom. Jesus, the groom, comes. We Man, men and women, we are the bride of Christ. We are the church and he loves us as we are. And when we love each other like he loves us, a watching world sees a gospel reenactment is what Tim Keller calls it in marriage. And it is a beautiful thing. So I can say it this way. Marriage is not just done in the church, okay, in the community of the church. Marriage is done for the church, for the witness of the church. That's what marriage is. It's a witness to the covenantal relationship that we have with God and we live it out with each other. So when Jesus says, you've heard it said, what did he mean by that? We have to go back into the historical context here. What did they hear? What he's saying is, you've heard this taught. You've heard it unpacked. You've heard it applied. You are to live just like this is what he's saying. This is the law. 
So what had they heard? Think about this. Adultery was not nearly as common in Jesus' day in a tight-knit Israeli or Jewish community than it is today. Think about it. The, the, in, in a tight-knit community, we see this in the story with, with Mary and Joseph in the, in the, in the Christmas story. Uh, everybody knew each other. Some of y'all from a small town, you're not getting away from anything, you know. And if you're like uh, Stacy and I, we're like, Lord, help our kids to get caught every time, you know. And in community, this is the problem with a lot of us. We don't live in community. And, and so we, are, are, we don't know what's happening. We don't have other parents to help us. To guide us, like when our kids say, I'm the only one that doesn't have a phone. You know, you're like, no, no, let's, let's talk about that. We've got others who are with us here. And we're all doing this together. It was big time that way in a tight-knit Jewish community. There, and you didn't have a bunch of singles running around. You didn't go clubbing. I mean, you didn't, you didn't have tender. You didn't swipe right. You weren't looking for a date. You didn't have a bunch of singles all around you. And you were under the authority, the loving authority of a home and community and a father and, and if you weren't, then you were, and young, often, you were married into a family where sometimes it was almost like uh, essentially an arranged marriage. And some of you parents think, that's a good idea. We need to bring that back. But, um, but, but adultery was rare, uh, is the point. Um, and, and we've come to think it's just a common thing. Now, it is uh, maybe not as common as you think it is, but, and yet, any one person, Right. And it's even, I know here even, in the church, we've experienced some of this. Um, most, uh, most there, it's kind of a, a lot of different numbers. I, I was doing a, di- a deep dive into this this week. Some show that 20, 25% of men uh, have committed adultery and just slightly lower, not dramatically lower for, for women, but a lot of them suggest right around 16, 18% of all married people, these aren't singles um, who were jumping in the mix, but uh, about that percentage uh, have committed adultery, who have admitted it, right, on a survey or, or research. So do the math. 21 million Americans have, have experienced this and all that comes with it. Now, maybe not surprisingly, infidelity in relationships where couples are not married but living together, much higher. It's like 40%. Of those couples have experienced uh, an infidel, and it's not adultery because they're not married, but still cheating and, and lying and all the things that go with that. So it, I want to offer a little counsel. Some people think, I, you, you hear this nowadays, well, you know, we ought to really live together before we get married. It's just going to help us. As if like, like you're getting a new car. So let's test drive this thing uh, and see if it works. And some even go so far as to say, you know, even sex before marriage perhaps could help us as we enter into marriage. Listen, sex before marriage will not prepare you for sex in marriage because they're not the same thing. Sex in marriage is a covenantal lifelong relationship between two people who are in it for life. The other is simply a satisfaction, lust can't wait to get, love can't wait to give, and it's, a, it's a simply a physical act between two people who are not in covenant relationship or legally binding, covenantal loving relationship, two very different things. And so what God is calling us to is something that is beautiful and wonderful, and, and here, even in our, uh, in our newlywed program we have here at our church, which is awesome, by the way, uh, we'll often sit with couples. Stacy and I met with a couple that's getting married uh, just this week. And uh, we, in our Nearly Wed program, we go through the prepare and enrich inventory, okay, which is a deep dive into your relationship across the board. And it is fascinating. But there's one aspect of it that's called idealistic distortion. Okay, so just hang with me for a sec. Which is, um, you know, imagine, you know, people get married at different ages, but imagine you're in your early 20s, you're getting married. Some of y'all remember this. And um, there's this... Uh, idealistic distortion is a distortion of reality and, and just an over idealistic approach. And so for the facilitator of the discussion, you get this, all this info back on the couple. It's like reading their mail. And, um, and it says, it highlights some, some statements that you need to discuss with the couple. Okay. Statements like if they put highly or, or strongly agree, okay, on these, my, my partner and I understand each other completely. And the married people among us giggle. (laughs) 
My partner completely understands and sympathizes with my every mood. How about this one? My partner has all the qualities I've always wanted in a mate. Don't laugh too, too loud because it gets a little awkward. Okay, um, how about this one? Every new, this is great. Every new thing I've learned about my partner has pleased me. Again, all the married couples are laughing. Single people are going, no, what? why would you marry someone that you, you know, right? And, and as a facilitator, as a pastor, I can't start giggling. I can't do that. I can't start laughing. Like, are you kidding? You, him? Are you kidding me? Like, really? You just have to, you know, be, just go, that, that's great. That's great. Um, how about this one? My fiance or my partner would never do anything to question my love for them. Again, the, 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 it's, it's done in such a way. Okay, facilitator, talk about that. Meaning, um, you might discover that your spouse, once married, is n not exactly like Jesus. They're going to do things that are going to cause you to question your love for them or, or, or perhaps even their, their love for you. And it happens. So what I'm getting to is this. In marriage, you can't hide. And yet some of us have a propensity to still do the same. And we do it in single, married. We have a tendency to have these private sins that we think we're, uh, that we're okay. We're good. We're good because I'm not really hurting anybody. That's kind of the, the title, right, of, 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 the, of our day, the, the mantra. So let's, let's jump to this next point here. The danger of the heart. That's what we're getting to now. The danger of the heart. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, and you know this goes, goes both ways, has already committed adultery in her heart. And this is a good translation here, by the way, with it, lustful intent. This means, I've, I've talked to guys who are like, well, like if I just look at a girl, is that lust? No, that's not lust. Um, I suppose a prolonged look. Or, but what it is is you're wanting that for yourself. And there's a line that's crossed in your mind. But you, you want that thing. You can lust for all kinds of things, right? Not just another person. But with lustful intent means I want this to fulfill my own desires. I want this for me. And now Jesus brings all of us in, single, young, and old, everybody. But watch this. He's not contradicting the law, as we've talked about even last week. He's not, he's not, he, even he said, right? I didn't come to dismantle the law. I've come to fulfill it. And he's not saying that all sins are the same, by the way. Because think about it. This anger towards another person is not the same as physical murder, okay? Lust is not the same as the physical act of adultery. So Methodius of Olympia, okay, early church bishop, around 300 AD, wrote this. Jesus is not counting as clean someone who avoids only the act of adultery. He wants the heart as well. And he writes this, listen to this. For it is not the fruit of adultery that he commands us to cast out, but the seed. He wants us to recognize the anatomy of temptation is what's happening here. And, and he wants us to see this progression of sin, okay? So Jesus brother James writes this in, in the first chapter of James and this is from the message I love this I've shared this before but listen to what it says in in James 1 don't let anyone under pressure to give in to evil say God is trying to trip me up God is impervious to evil and puts evil in no one's way the temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us we have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lusts, our own desires to have what we want to have. Now, this is significant before we press on. In our day, where people are like, hey, I was born this way. Just is what it is. And we have all kinds of strange sexual, you know, uh, deviant desires, don't we? And we all do. Um, and, and, and so, but to say, hey, I'm kind of wired this way. I mean, it's the old, you know, boys will be boys. No, boys will be godly before God Almighty because that's the good life. And, and so what he's saying here is, no, 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 don't blame God. God made me like this. No, no, no. Now watch this. Lust gets pregnant. The verse goes on. It has a baby. Sin. 
Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. So my very dear friends, my beloved friends, don't get thrown off course. See, lust, this desire to have what I want starts as a small seed and then it grows up as a baby. Sin or this lust becomes then uh, a certain look, relationship together. Time spent hiding out. Maybe there's texts that are sent back and forth that nobody knows about. There's time together. You're feeding this thing. It's growing up. And then it becomes adultery. And, I, and I'm telling you, as a pastor, I've sat with way too many couples that have walked through this. And it is devastating. Why? Because we know as Christians what the beauty of marriage and this sacred gift it is. And we all know this. It's this, again, this gospel reenactment between two people. So we see the depth of command is for us to experience a marriage and life together as he's called us. We see this, then, uh, this, this danger of the human heart with the propensity to hide out. And then we see now this final drastic call to action. Now, anybody who doesn't understand what I've talked about, the sanctity of marriage, Christian vision of marriage, would think, this is crazy stuff. This is crazy talk. Watch this. If your eye, you, you heard it, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away. It's better to lose just your eye than your whole body to go to hell. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Because it's better for you to lose a member of your body, one hand, than your whole body going to hell. What is he saying here? Jesus is using hyperbolic language. And so all of them, we hear that and we go, whew, good, because that, I mean, that, that is wild. Okay, it's just hyperbole. But no, 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 don't miss this. He's doing this for a reason. This is dramatic. This is so dramatic and crazy that we really need to get underneath this, okay? Remove any, this is what he's saying, right? Remove anything from your life that's keeping you from fully committing your life to God. Commentator Donald Hagner, he says it this way, where lust exists, the discipleship of the kingdom requires dramatic and determined action. To rid oneself of the cause, the discipleship of, uh, in the kingdom is a serious matter that requires true, unreserved, absolute commitment. So don't miss this, every single person Young and old, single or not, married, unmarried, remarried, wherever you find yourself today, I'm calling you. Jesus is calling us to a life of sexual purity. And wherever that comes in your own personal life, because some of us are already deep in. Some of us are either habitual sin regarding pornography. Maybe we're in a relationship and you're all, you already have thought about it. Maybe you're wrestling with the fact that you have failed, failed big time. And this has been an awkward and challenging sermon for you. And I'm going to remind us all of the grace of God, how he has redeemed us. Jesus says, okay, don't commit adultery. Don't do this, but do this. What is this? Um, Self-mutilation? He's saying it's better to sacrifice something, how about this, that is not vital not necessary to give your whole life to God. Now think about this. Let's apply as we close. Whatever's causing you to sin, you need to cut it out. And I'm asking the Spirit just to speak to you. There are way too many things that we think are necessary in our lives. This is what Jesus is getting to. Some of you need to get rid of internet in your house. Wait, who does that? Thousands of years of people have done that. <laughs> right? Maybe you need to get rid of your phone. You need a simple phone. Get a flip phone. You need, you need a phone that doesn't have apps or the internet. And parents, I mean, some of y'all know, you know, get a gap phone. Get a phone that you can just communicate with. Do, and, and I'm telling you, Christian families, parents, this is not in my notes. We need to lead the way. Regarding phones, this is going to be big. I mean, it is big now. Christian families should, should come together and say, our kids, sorry kids, are not getting phones until they're this certain age. Jonathan Haidt, among others, are saying 16 years old. You don't need a phone. Get, or get a certain type of phone. And some of you adults need to follow this as well. You need to 
quit going to that place. You need to stop going that route that takes you to that thing. You need to remove your gym membership. Whatever it is, you need, watch this, you need to change your job. You need to get out of that department. You need to come clean. I've had men come to me, whether with, with a wife there or I, I've been in interventions. I've talked to men privately. I had, I tell a man, listen, we talked through it. Long story short, uh, your wife knows what's up. And here's her name. Most men, before they're caught red-handed, they will continue to lie. Women will do the same. But caught cold-blooded, this man says, Jeff, what should I do? I say, you need to go to this woman. You need to tell her you're done. You will never talk to her again, that you're going back to your sweet wife and your family, and you are done with this man. You're drawing a line, I mean this woman, and you are done. You're finished. You need to do that today. That's what you need to do. Jesus is calling us to dramatic and drastic efforts, whatever it takes. And this should fall on all of us, myself included, as I'm, as I'm preparing for this message. What is it, God? What is it drastic thing that I need to do so that I can rid myself of the sin that I am so quick to run to? And it's at varied levels and of lust and all the things, but some of us need to seek counseling. We need to come clean. We need to talk to another man or woman. We need to talk to our spouse. Get completely honest. Where do you, where, where do you lie? You're prone to lie. I had a friend, a, a man that was talking about how he, he went by McDonald's on his way home. And later his wife asked him, well, what would you do for dinner? Have you already eaten? Oh, no, no, I'm good. I'm ready to eat some more. What's that about? Right? My point is we have these little lies that, that, that break the covenantal bond of honesty and openness. You, you may not be living a full-on double life, but we all are adulterers. We're all sexual sinners, and that's what Jesus wants us to see, not to beat us down, but because he wants us to repent and recognize that we are redeemed. And, and friends, my, my experience tells me that sexual sin in particular uh, there's more shame involved because Satan wants to keep you down and keep you there in the past of all the mistakes you've made, all the things you've done. But there is grace for the sexual sinner. <laughs> and we see it throughout the Bible in Jesus' encounters. And here's the thing. We're going to close it this way. You don't need to cut off your hand. You don't need to gouge out your eye. You don't need to bloody or maim yourself. Because Jesus has already gone there for you. Jesus has already done that. As your substitute, the punishment that should come to us, as we've already celebrated today, the blood shed, his body given over for us is so that we could be forgiven and completely redeemed for whatever we have done. Some of us need to leave the past behind. And remember that Jesus paid it all. So we're going to close our time. I'm going to pray over us and we're going to sing a song together to reflect on what God is saying to you. And gang, again, a tender, tender time today. And so I want us to pray together as we close our time. If you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Don't, don't let your mind race off. We have a moment in time to do business with God. So what is he saying to you today? Perhaps the, the sexual shame has crept back up. Maybe it's the anger that you have experienced again for your own uh, a spouse or someone close to you who, who you have forgiven or maybe you need to forgive. And just re be reminded of that today, that that person is redeemed. You can praise him for that. And you're redeemed. He has bought you with a price. If you know the Lord, you're set free. If you don't know him, friend, you're still living in sin, separated from God. But he's saying to you, come to me. I have paid the price for you. Friends, Jesus, he really did pay it all so that his love for us 
could be the driver so that we could obey him from this day on for the rest of our lives to live in purity before him and celebrate the grace he's extended to us. So, Lord, we, we give you our lives. Lord, I pray for those who've never received your grace. Today would be the day right now. And as we continue to reflect on what you have done for us, we thank you today that you've set us free. And for those of us who need to act, we need all of us. We need some drastic move. Maybe for some right now in the moment it's coming for prayer. Maybe it's a confession of sin. Maybe it is simply to join the church family, say, I'm not going to live in secret. I'm going to live in the body. Maybe it's joining a connect group, committing yourself to be in his word, to get a dwell journal today before you head out. Lord, speak to us and thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for paying the price for our sin. We pray in your name. Amen.